Thank you, Dean. We're going to spend a, a couple of minutes in prayer here, but let me just do a follow-up on what Dean talked about, those prayer cards. I didn't come up with that idea. Somebody much smarter than me came up with that idea. And uh, so they said last week, instead of just praying when you're gone to Africa, why don't you give us some specific things to pray for? So let me just follow up on what Dean said. There's two colored pieces of paper here. When I get to Africa, I'm going to teach two classes. Each class is two weeks long, and there's 25 pastors in each class. And they're different pastors. They all come from Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Mozambique. But they all show up at this same place. And so we will spend two weeks teaching the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus, five hours a day, every day for two weeks. Okay? It's like a whole year. It's like going through the book of Galatians in seven months. It's like going through those two books. But we do it all in two weeks. And then the next two weeks, we're going to spend two weeks... Oh, I, I do know what we're teaching there. We're uh, going to teach a theology class on some, uh, some fun things. We're not there to uh, bore these guys. We're there to get them excited about God's word. And so I think I shared part of this before. We're going to spend one day talking about how do we know that this really is the Bible. And we're going to spend five hours, not five minutes. We're going to spend five hours on that. Then we're going to spend the next day, we're going to talk about God the Father, the next day God the Son, the next day God the Holy Spirit. We're going to spend five hours one day talking about salvation. How do you know you're really saved? We're going to spend five hours talking about the church. What is this thing that comes together from time to time? I'm not talking about the buildings. I'm talking about the people. And we're going to spend five hours one day talking about angels. And the next thing you know, I'll be home. So just like that. But on that sheet, in addition to why, if you want to take one of each, that would be great. But I don't know how many of, there's 25, you know, there's 25 pastors. And you, so if you take one per family of each color, that'll just work out perfect, okay? Now, some, and on that piece of paper is a specific name of a pastor that you can pray for, one guy. Now, some of these names are just like the family that lives next door to you. There's a, some of you are going to have a Stephen on there. Okay, you're not praying, you can pray for me, but that's not me on that, okay? And there's an Isaac and a Samuel. We've got grandsons, Isaac and Samuel. You're not praying for my grandkids, you're praying for, th and then some of those are African names, which you will recognize right away. That's a different name. So, thank you. Greatly appreciate that. And I'll give you a full report when I get back here, okay? So let's spend some time praying, working through our prayer list that we have here at Indy Lake. So let's just join our hearts together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for once again allowing us to come into your presence. God, it's good to be here this morning. It's good to be able to remind ourselves when we gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ, to remind ourselves that you really are a living, loving, gracious, kind, merciful God. And just for the hour or so that we come together, we, we get away from the world and we get away from all of our distractions and we give this hour to you as a form of our worship and we just ask that you would accept this, that it would be the things that we do here, the things that we say, that it would be pleasing in your sight and God, that you would accept that from our hearts as a form of worship. Lord, we're here this morning to give ourselves to you. We're not here to ask. We're not here to take. We're here to give. And so when we give in songs, when we give, when we take the offering, when we give in prayer, when we just give our attention to the reading of your word, Lord, those are all things that we're trying to do that are pleasing to you. And we ask, Lord, that you'd accept that. And then, Lord, as we gather together, we realize that this is not a perfect world and we're not perfect people. And there are a number of brothers and sisters in Christ here at Indian Lake who are going through difficult times. And so we bring them before you today and ask that in each and every situation, your will would be done. And Lord, as we work our way through this list, we, we are mindful of the fact that there are probably, there are probably without a doubt, men and women, boys and girls from the Indian Lake family who are not on this specific list, but Lord, our hearts and prayers go for them as well. But this morning, Lord, we pray for Jeanette, and we're grateful that she's here this morning. We ask that you would give her doctors wisdom on how to best treat 
her health concerns. Lord, thank you for the joy that she brings to so many people. And Lord, I know and she knows and we know that she struggled with some physical things lately. We just ask that you would go above and beyond anything that the doctors think or can do and Lord, that you would bring complete healing into her life. We pray again for Lee and Fern. We ask that as they adjust to their, their new life together in a new location, that's our prayer, that they would feel your presence and be able to enjoy your presence in their, their life together in uh, Minnesota. We pray for both Don and Delbert as they continue to have health concerns, Lord, as they go through rehab and whatever other things they're involved in, we ask that you would uh, be with them, walk with them, hold them close. Give them the desire, Lord, to have quiet times with you and you alone. Lord, may they be driven to your word and to times in prayer, and may you do your work in both of their lives. We pray for Barb and Earl as they continue probably day after day. There's some uh, care concerns. There's some strength and health concerns. We ask that you'd come alongside of them, Lord, that you would meet every need that they have. We pray for our Corinne families, Lord, who here at Indian Lake, we have specific people here at Indian Lake who have extended family in Myanmar, Burma, and Lord, in the midst of that crazy war over there, Lord, there are people being killed and slaughtered, and it just, it, it just is heartbreaking when we realize that there are people here, friends of ours, who have family members there who are going through extremely difficult times. And Lord, on one hand, we pray that you would just care for the people there in Burma, Myanmar, and yet, Lord, we know that war is devastating and it's terrible and it's horrible and there's, it's hard to imagine that anything good could ever come out of a war. But Lord, our prayers for our family members who were there, Lord, protect them from harm. And even in the midst of all of the problems and all of the war, we ask that the name of Jesus would be lifted high. We pray, Lord, for our missionaries, a dozen or more missionaries here from Indian Lake who are scattered around the world doing what you have called and asked them to do. Many of them are serving in regions where the name of Jesus is not lifted high. We ask that you would keep them safe, that you would give them wisdom on how to advance the gospel in places of difficult ministry. We ask, Lord, that you would hear their prayers and answer their prayers and that they would be obedient in doing what you've asked them to do. We pray, Lord, for our search team here at Indian Lake. We ask that you'd continue to give them wisdom, guidance, patience. Lord, I know they've asked, that they've asked us as a church body to pray for them. And so as they work through this, this sometimes long process, Lord, we ask that You'd, you'd give them special wisdom on how and when to proceed when they make decisions. We pray, Lord, for our government. Lord, we, all of us would agree that things are com seem like from day to day, there's things that are upside down and backwards and it makes no sense to us. And yet, God, we remind ourselves that you're a sovereign God who's in absolute control of everything that happens. Lord, you've asked us to pray for those who are in authority over us not to gossip about them, not to complain, not to criticize, but God, you've asked us to pray. And so this morning again, we wanna pray for President Biden. We wanna pray for Governor Tim Waltz, for Governor Kim Reynolds in Iowa, and for Governor Kristi Noem in South Dakota. We ask, Lord, as we prayed week after week, we ask that you'd bring godly men and women into some kind of a relationship with these leaders who can encourage them to make godly decisions. Lord, that uh, these four people that we bring before you this morning, the three governors and President Biden, Lord, we ask that they would be drawn close to you, each and every one of them. That many of them are faced in making decisions that none of us would want to make. Lord, we ask that at the end of the day, at the end of the week, that each of these these, these four leaders could feel like they're closer to you than they perhaps have been in many years. And we pray for us as a church, Lord, that we would do our very best to care for and to minister to all the people here who call Indian Lake our home. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Well, yes, I know Dean already said good morning, and I want to echo that again. It's, it's, it's good to see you this morning. Um, whether you're here in the building or I can look into that camera, whether you're out there in the world someplace signed in through YouTube, we're, we're grateful that you're here. And you, that you've, we're grateful that here in the building as well as online that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. This is our last week, and I know if I listen real close, there's some of you are going to say hallelujah. This is our last week from the sermon series in Galatians. So we've been in here every Sunday for seven months, and we finally have arrived at the last verse in chapter 16, which is actually chapter 6, what we looked at last week. So on Wednesday this week, I leave for Africa, and when I return to Indian Lake, Lord willing, on Sunday, June 13th, if you still want me back, we're going to start a new sermon series, okay? Um, I just found out on Friday that in addition to all that teaching, I, I've known for months I was going to do that. Now they want me to teach for, uh, do two chapel services over there as well. So um, Sharon said to me, <laughs> Nobody had said anything about that until I got that email on Friday, and here I'm going to be there next week. So uh, they're going to get a couple of messages from, guess where, Galatians. <laughs> that seems to be in the forefront of my mind lately. So, But before we close the book on Galatians this morning, for one last time, I want us to remind us of the three principles from the book of Galatians. Now we've got six chapters and you're, you're gonna eventually get this down. Now here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Galatians. And I can't force anybody to do anything nor would I want to force anybody. But I wanna strongly encourage you that when you open your Bible to the book of Galatians and you wonder why the publisher gave you that white space on Galatians chapter one, there's about an inch of white space in everybody's Bible. Like there you can see my Bible. Now, what in the world is that white space for? It's for, and I say this tongue-in-cheek, it's so that we can write things in there as a way to remember things about the book of Galatians. So I think this is a perfect place to write these three principles. And here's, here's principle number one from the book of Galatians. There's only one gospel. We've talked about this. I'm not going to talk about it again, just the verse. Galatians 1, 6 and 7 says this, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who has called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. And then he says in verse 7, which is really no gospel at all. Okay, so remember, there's no such thing as a Baptist gospel, Lutheran gospel, Methodist gospel, Presbyterian gospel, Assembly of God gospel, Reformed gospel, whatever. It is. There's no such thing. There's the gospel. Jesus came. He's the Son of God. He lived a perfect life. At the end of his life, he was crucified. He bled. He paid the price for our sin with his blood on the cross. He died on the cross. He was buried. Three days later, God brought him back to life. He walked on the earth for 40 days. Then he returned to heaven. And here's the thing. Someday he's coming back, and he's going to gather his followers together. He's not taking everybody to heaven. Everybody's not going. It's just those people who have repented of their sin and have their faith in Jesus. And he's coming back and he's going to take us and we're all going with him back to heaven. That's the gospel. Okay, the second principle is salvation is by Jesus, faith in Jesus plus nothing. And we all memorize that verse. And you don't have time, we don't have time today to have everybody say it one at a time. So let me do it. It's from Galatians 2, 15 and 16. It says, we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Works of the law isn't going to save anybody. Salvation is by faith in Jesus plus nothing. Baptism doesn't count. Taking communion. We're going to take communion this morning. It doesn't count for salvation. Reading your Bible, doesn't, none of that. Do I think it's important? Yes, but not for salvation. We are not justified by the works of the law. We're justified by faith in Jesus. Principle number three, do good to all people. Galatians 6, 9, and 10 says this, Let us now become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Real quick, in a nutshell, we talked about that verse last week. There's a difference between being kind and doing good. And we know that it's two different things because in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit Kindness and goodness are separate things. So the big picture is being kind involves almost always verbal things. 
I remember I talked about uh, your, your next door neighbor who spent six months, in, six months in Texas, send you a text message and say, we'll be home next week, and you reply back and say, we'll be praying for you. That's being kind. The family next door is going through a health crisis, and, and you go over and you say, hey, we're so sorry to hear what's going on, and, and that's being kind. Doing good involves actually doing something. Doing good involves before your neighbor gets home from Texas, you go over and mow his lawn. That's what it means to do good. Or when the family next door is going through a health crisis and you bring a hot dish over to them, that's doing good. Being kind is praying for them, encouraging them. But there's a difference between being kind and doing good. Well, okay, that's our three principles. And everybody's got those now engraved in the first page of Galatians in your Bible, and you'll have those forevermore as a reference to what we talked about every Sunday since last, since a long time ago. Now, let me say this. Here at Indian Lake, the search team's working hard trying to find your next pastor. And I know from experience it can be an incredibly difficult time. It can be, it's a, a, a incredibly responsible position to be on the, the search team. But when you find the right guy, it's worth all the effort. And they've asked us to keep praying. So now with that in mind, I'm going to read you a resume this morning that I ran across last week. And I'm wondering if the person, I'm going to read this resume, I'm wondering if maybe this person is the guy whom we've been praying for. So let me read it. It says this, Dear Pastor, I'm looking for an opportunity for ministry and wondered if your church has a position available. I'm a single man in my 50s, rather short, slightly built, balding with a beard. My health is not the best. I have difficulty with my vision. But despite my physical limitations, I've seen the Lord use me in many ways. I've never been able to stay in full-time ministry for long because of repeated problems with my finances. But I always have continued serving the Lord, even when I've had to take a secular job. I used to have a violent temper. This is incredible. This guy's willing to, he used to have, so that's in the past. I used to have a violent temper, but the Lord has given me victory over that problem. As my resume shows, I've been involved in the starting of several churches, although I've never stayed in one place for more than three years. I admit I'm not a persuasive or eloquent public speaker. In fact, I've been criticized over my speaking. But I do maintain that the Lord uses me in this capacity, and I would like to have opportunities to speak regularly in your church. Some have complained about my speaking because at times I get carried away and forget about the clock. I must also warn you that my teaching has often stirred up controversy, even to the point of causing fighting in some towns. I don't want to hide the fact that I've been sent to prison several times for my part in causing such disturbances. My life has been threatened on numerous occasions, and I've been physically attacked several times. Several evangelical churches are divided in their opinions about me. Even some of the churches I helped to start have now turned against me. I've done some writing on various theological and church-related topics, although a well-known Christian leader complained that I am hard to understand in places. I'm not particularly strong at administrative details, being somewhat forgetful, but I'm a hard-driving, zealous, dedicated man. I believe I could be useful in the ministry of your church, especially in discipling any young men who want to follow the Lord. Please let me hear from you. Now, as you think about whether or not we want to follow up with this guy, I think I should let you know that that's the resume of the Apostle Paul. He's got health problems. He's got finance problems. He doesn't stay long in one place. He admits he's not a great speaker. <clears throat> Some people say he's difficult to understand. Some people say his sermons are too long. And he's not particularly good at administrative details. And except for the part that talks about his, his height and his beard and all that stuff, which comes from extra biblical information, historical information, everything in that list is from the New Testament describing the Apostle Paul. Paul is a guy whose resume, if you were on the search team, if you received that actual resume, you'd kind of laugh at it and throw it aside and never look at it again. Are we really looking for somebody that's been in and out of prison? Really? 
Are we looking for somebody who admits and has received numerous complaints that his sermons are boring and they're way too long? Is that, the, is that what we're looking for? And you know, we can go right on through that list. He's got health issues, his sight, he, he's not very good at administrative details. Is that the kind of guy we're really looking for? But Paul was the guy whose resume, even though we probably would overlook it and throw it, throw it into the shredder before we realized that here's a guy, here's a guy that God used to change the world. That's his resume. Paul is the guy who wrote this letter to the churches in Galatia. And by the way, I suppose we've talked about this in the past. Of the 13 letters we have from the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, this is the only one that's written to multiple churches at the same time. Now, we have some reason to believe that some of those letters that Paul wrote were passed around between churches, but this one is specifically written to four churches at the same time. And so for the rest of our time this morning, since we've already gone through all six chapters, every verse, we're going to spend our time reminding us of who is this guy? Who is this guy named Paul? Where does he come from? What's his background? I mean, those of us who have been hanging around church for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we've got a general idea of who Paul is. But who is this guy? And, and what made this guy give up his pursuit of trying to... Think about this. This is the guy that was trying to destroy Christianity. And God changed his heart. And he became what many of us believe is the greatest missionary the world has ever seen. So first of all, I think we should understand that Paul is no ordinary guy. His life story is a story of how a person's life can change from the inside out when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. His story is a story of redemption in Christ. His life story is a story that reminds us that no one is beyond the saving grace of Jesus Christ. No one is beyond that. His life story is a reminder to us that God never gives up on anyone. I remember years ago, I, I was on the other side of that search team meeting one time and at one of the churches we served, and I still remember a question. You know, they had me before the church and they were they had the splinters out for the fingernails and they were ready to scratch my eyes out and all those kind of things. And they asked me this one question, would I ever give up on somebody? Boy, that's an interesting question. I won't tell you who it was, but that was years ago and I could still remember the person that asked that question. And my answer is, my answer, I don't think my answer has changed since then. Would I, ever, would I really ever give up on somebody? And my answer is it, no. I won't. But there comes a time, I've only got so much time in my week, I've only got so much time in a day, I've only got so much time in a year, and I am not going to keep spending time week after week, month after month, year after year with somebody who doesn't exhibit any desire to change, okay? There's too many other people out here who are hungry for the Word, who are hungry for God's Word, who are hungry to learn how to pray, who are hungry and they want to grow in their faith. I can't spend time with both, so where, who am I going to spend time with? I'm going to spend most of my time with people who have exhibited a desire to walk with Jesus. Now, with that said, I can't tell you how many times I've, in the last 30 years, I came home to Sharon and said, Pfft. That's it. I'm done with this guy. I've met with this guy for 17 weeks in a row, and he just has no desire to change anything. There's too many people that I know who want my time and who want to grow in their walk with Jesus. So I'm, at some point, I just am honest with that guy. It's always a guy. It's never a woman. I don't get involved with discipling women. But I've said that to Sharon many times. That's it. I'm done. But God, it's not that I'm giving up. And I want you to know, God never gives up. But for us humans, there's only so much time in the day. God is always there. We need to remind ourselves that God is always there, ready to forgive us if we're willing to repent. <coughs> 
1 John 1, 9 says, if, if, that's a key word in that verse on confession, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin. But he's not just going to, we have to exhibit, we're part of the thing here. So if we're willing to repent and put our faith in Jesus. Paul's early life was marked by, I think, at least three things. One is he had a strong passion for religion. By the way, I've discovered over the years, everybody's religious. Do you realize that? Everybody you meet is religious. They're not all Christians, but everybody is religious. Everybody worships something. Religion is just a, a word, if you, if you boil it down, it just means, what is it that I'm worshiping? Now, some people worship God. I'm, I would say I'm, I'm grateful that I'm religious. I, I love to worship God. There's other people who have no time for God, but let's understand that they're still religious. They worship their money. They worship their new car. They worship their fancy house. Everybody is religious. Paul, from the get-go, had a strong passion for religion. He also was involved in brutal violence. Now, let's just think about this. Brutal violence, when we talk a little bit about him and what he was involved in doing, trying to destroy and stop Christianity from spreading... And he was also deeply involved in persecuting the early church. But then, and if you remember the story, Paul put his faith in Jesus Christ and he spent the rest of his life dedicated not to destroying Christianity, but to advancing Christianity. At birth, his name was Saul. Not Paul. It was Saul. Probably, we, don't have, we can't prove this, but probably named after the first king in Israel, Saul. Throughout the New Testament, his name seems to switch back and forth between, well, you know how that is. One day you're reading he's Paul, and the next day you're reading somewhere else, and he's Saul, and then it's back to Paul. And, and there are people who, you may be right, there are people who think he changed his name from Saul to Paul. And I've shared that in the midst of Galatians a couple times. I don't think he ever changed his name. I think he used... Saul when he was with Jewish people and I think he used the name Paul when he was with Gentiles so here's this guy and it, it, there's a number of examples which I'm not going to use but a number of examples that people in the gospels especially had they you know they'd Steve his name's Steve but they also call him Bob you know it, it's like that remember uh, I can't even think of one at the moment but Let's look at the map. Who's, who's driving back there? Let's look at this map. Paul, can you see that from where you're at? You can see part of it. Paul is from the Blue Star. He's from Tarsus up there in Cilicia. Today, Cilicia would be known as the country of Turkey. And 600 miles south, the Red Star is Jerusalem. Now, just think about that. 600 miles between where Paul's from and Jerusalem. Paul was born up there on the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea. He was born either in the same decade as when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, or if it wasn't the exact decade, it was very close. These guys are born at the same time. There are 12 tribes of Israel. We could name these if we wanted to. Let me read the list. They're all named after Jacob's sons. The 12 tribes were Asher, Dan, Ephraim, Gad, Issachar, Manasseh, Naphtali, Reuben, Simeon, Zebulun, Judah, and Benjamin. Jesus' human family traces its lineage from the tribe of Judah. Paul's family traces its lineage from the tribe of Benjamin. If you have your Bibles, keep one hand in Galatians. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3 and let me read verses 4, 5, and 6. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. That's how we know Paul's lineage. A Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal regarding the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Faultless. That's how he thinks of himself. Paul's parents were zealous Jews. They strictly obeyed the laws of Moses. The very laws that Paul later says, those are not the laws that are going to get us salvation. In fact, he says, those are the laws that aren't going to save anybody. It's only faith in Jesus. But Paul grows up in this home, very strict, learning how the, what the laws of Moses are and why they should obey him. His parents would have been very, very strict. Let's use that word again. They do not want their son 
running around, hanging around with Gentiles because he's going to get, the word that could be used, he's going to get contaminated by hanging around Gentiles. I would guess if we could back up the wagon train here in 1873, am I right, John? 1873, Indian Lake. Started by a bunch of Swedes, okay? We didn't want to get contaminated hanging around a bunch of Norwegians or whatever else was here, Germans or something. So I would guess on that first Sunday in 1873 it was nothing but Swedes here at Indian Lake. But now we've, we've recognized there are other people beyond Christians. I mean, who are Christians beyond Swedes. <laughs> Rewind that tape. So, <laughs> yes. Any association with Gentiles would have been unheard of in Saul's family where he's growing up. As he grows up, they're probably speaking Greek, maybe Latin. When the doors are closed and they're all at home having supper, they're probably speaking Aramaic around the table. Aramaic is kind of an offshoot of Hebrew. Saul's family were Roman citizens. Now here they are. There they were. Just leave that. You don't need to go back. Remember where that... He's from this little town up here in the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea, and they're Roman citizens. Turn with me to Acts 22. Let me read a handful of verses. Acts 22, 22. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voice and shouted, Rid the earth of him, he's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing all their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, now, if you're following along in the Bible, in your middle, verse 25, as they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing here, in the Steve Anderson translation, there's one more word in here. The Steve Anderson translation would read like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, P, uh, Paul said to the centurion standing there, hey, hey, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do, he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. The commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul said. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Okay, when Paul is 13 or 14 years old, or maybe as old as 15, his parents began looking for a rabbi to train their son. In fact, all good Jewish families were always looking for a rabbi who could train their teenage son. So we have every reason to believe, and history would tell us, that when Paul was 13 or 14, or maybe as old as 15, his parents sent him to Jerusalem. You remember how far, that away, how far away that is? It's 600 miles. And he was trained by a rabbi named Gamaliel. Now, hold that thought. You remember when Jesus is starting his ministry, and he's way up north, and he's walking along the Sea of Galilee, and one day he sees these two boats with, and he says to John and his brother James, and he says to the guys in the next boat, Peter and his brother Andrew, come follow me. You remember that? And they dropped everything, and these guys started following Jesus. It's, it, they know Jesus is a rabbi. He's actually, at one point, he's called Rabboni. He's a rabbi of rabbis. And so when the rabbi invites these young Jewish guys to come and follow him, that's an answer to their prayers. They have been praying that there would be a rabbi who would train these guys. And that's why, outside of the Bible, because it doesn't talk about that specifically in the Bible, we have every reason to believe that some of these disciples, when they started following Jesus, were 13, 14, 15 years old. These aren't 30-year-old guys. These are young guys who want to be trained by a rabbi. 
Saul is from Tarsus, way up there in the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea, and he's being trained by a rabbi in Jerusalem named Gamaliel. Turn with me to Acts 22, verse 3, where Paul is speaking here. He's on trial. He says, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicily, which would be, we talked about that a minute ago, that would be Turkey in 2021. I'm a Jew born in Tarsus, but brought up in this city. He's talking, he's in Jerusalem now. I studied under Gamaliel and was thirty thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. It was while he and all other young Jewish guys who were being trained by rabbis, they're studying all kinds of things. They're studying Jewish history. They're studying the scrolls, the scrolls that they have, the works and the writings of the prophets. They're studying the Psalms. His, his training, like every other uh, person about to become a rabbi, would have involved five or six years. I, you know, I can't even imagine. We've got two grandsons that are 13. Am I right? I know. <laughs> I think they're both 13. And uh, I can't even imagine sending them 600 miles away. Oh, well, you'll be back in five years. Just think of the commitment they were to Judaism. They want these guys trained. They want them to know what it means to be a good Jewish person. Because of his commitment to excellence, everything we know about Paul probably tells us that he was headed to join the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was like joining the Supreme Court. In Israel, there were only 71 people in the Sanhedrin, and they were all men. And we have every reason to believe that because Paul excelled in his studies, that he was headed to be on the Sanhedrin. He was zealous for his faith. His faith did not allow for compromise. He knew what he believed, and he wasn't going to change his mind. It's this commitment that led Paul down the road of what we call religious extremism. We know this, that Saul he's still using the name Saul, was a witness in Acts chapter 7, turn there with me, he was a witness to the stoning of a guy named Stephen. This is the first martyr after Jesus returned to heaven, okay? Acts 7, 57 and 58, at this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they rushed at him, they're rushing at Stephen, not at Saul, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. He's there when the first martyr since Jesus returned to heaven. Saul was determined to do whatever was necessary in order to eliminate Christianity from the face of the earth. He thought it was a terrible religion. He thought it was just going to take people away from Judaism and it had no hope and offered nothing about eternal life. He was, he was ruthless. Can we use that word? He was ruthless in his pursuit of destroying Christianity. Someone once said, and I think they're right, Someone once said that there's nothing more frightening than a person who is willing to kill people because they believe God wants them to do that. Now just think of that. There's nothing more frightening. I just think back to what happened in America in 9-11 on 2001. There's nothing more frightening when these guys are willing to kill innocent people because they think they're doing it in a way that will honor their God. Acts 8, 3 says, but Paul began to destroy the church. <laughs> Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them into prison. But soon thereafter, while traveling on his way to, to Damascus, and he only has one reason he's leaving Jerusalem to go to Damascus. The only reason he's going there is to arrest Christians and put them in jail. It says in Acts 9, verse 3, this is when Saul meets Jesus. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. And from that moment on, Paul's life, Saul's life, was literally turned upside down. His boldness, this is what's incredible, his boldness doesn't diminish. His boldness increases. But he's no longer looking to destroy Christianity, now he's looking to advance Christianity. Acts 9.22, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving, 
This is what's he's now proving that Jesus is the Messiah. He refused to believe that before. By the time we get to Acts chapter 11, verse 25, Saul is now teaching the principles of Christianity in the church in Antioch. Just think of what's, how this guy's life has changed. Verse 25 says, Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And when we get to Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas are now sent on what we call Paul's first missionary journey. I, I am convinced when they left Antioch that day, headed to Cyprus and then up to Galatia, I'm convinced that they were not, Paul wasn't keeping track of this. Well, in his journal, he said, here's our first missionary journey. And then they said, I don't think he numbered them like we number them. Let me read the first three verses in Acts 13. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, called, here's another one, got another name, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off, and the world has never been the same. The world has never been the same. Paul's first missionary journey was with Barnabas, and their destination, their first destination, was to the island of Cyprus. And if you remember this, it, we could look it up in Acts. We know from Acts that Barnabas is from Cyprus. I remember when we talked about this seven months ago. It makes all the sense in the world that Barnabas wants to go to Cyprus because he's got family there. He's got relatives there who need to hear about Jesus. So they go to Cyprus, and then they wander around the whole island, and I'm not saying that facetiously, like they're wandering around, they don't know what they're doing. They just cross the whole island, and then where are we going to go? Well, let's go north. Let's go up into that land that's called Galatia. And if you remember this from seven months ago, this land, there's this region up on the north side of the Mediterranean that two or three hundred years before Paul and Barnabas arrived there, there was a group of refugees that emigrated from France. And they began living there. Only two or three hundred years before Paul went up there, France wasn't called France, it was called Gaul. And so when all these people from Gaul emigrated to this region, it became known as Galatia. That's how we get the name Galatia. And when he's there, he teaches these guys, these men and women, boys and girls, three principles. Number one, there's only one gospel. Number two, salvation is by faith in Jesus, plus nothing else. And the third principle, do good to all people. Amen. Now let me say this before we have communion. This has really been a blessing for Sharon and I to be here almost every Sunday for these seven or eight. Well, I think that first Sunday when I preached over here, we were in the lawn back then. You know, do you remember when we were outside? Of course you do. I think that might have been in June or July, the first time we came over for a week or two. And then we're gone in August. But it is, I have to tell you, both Sharon and I, this has been a real blessing for us to be here. And you guys have been so kind and so um, gracious toward us as we walked our way for seven months through the book of Galatians. And I have to, you put up with all my crazy stories. And I know you prayed for us during the week. And it has been an absolute joy for us to be here. Wednesday, I head off for Zambia. I, I want to thank you ahead of time for praying. And even in addition to praying, I want to thank you for your missionary offering, which goes to help support our ministry, Project 1 Aid. And I, I can just tell you, I will do my best to represent Jesus in Zambia, but I will also do my best to represent Indian Lake Baptist Church when I get there next week. You guys are, you know, you're more than just this church in rural Worthington. It's, you, you know my story, this will always be home, but it's been a real blessing for us to be here now. We're gonna have communion, but Dean, are we doing this right? Am I doing communion first? Okay. I thought it would be appropriate this morning when we celebrate communion to read the communion passage 
from the Apostle Paul instead of the Gospels. Before I read scripture, did we miss anybody? Does any, everybody that wants to take communion, do you have a cup and a wafer? Otherwise, we're gonna, somebody will bring you one. If you need one, raise your hand. Okay, thank you, Jim. And there's somebody on the north side over here, too. Thank you. So I'm going to read this morning from, first, you guys just keep your hands up. He'll get it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, written by the Apostle Paul, says this in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this cup and drink this, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, this fancy little wrapping thing here has two, two parts to it. It has a piece of bread on the top. And then underneath the bread is a cup of juice. Now just give me one minute because I've never, and this is correct, I've never done this without spilling this. <laughs> this bread represents the body of Christ and how he hung on the cross his body was bruised and broken the juice represents the blood that Jesus shed which paid the full price for all of our sin now I'm going to offer a prayer for the bread and the juice but then I just want to encourage you before before you eat the bread and drink the cup. I want to strongly encourage everybody to just offer a silent prayer. Nobody around you can hear this. I would just want you to pray a couple things. Thanking God for sending Jesus. And the second prayer would be if you have any unconfessed sin in your life, this is the time to come clean. We're not going to ask you to come forward. We're not going to ask you to stand and tell us what that sin is. But just silently ask God to forgive you. Forgive you of that sin that you committed yesterday and you, f you have not asked to be forgiven of. Or maybe it was a month ago or a year ago or 17 years ago. And you still to this moment have not asked God to forgive you of whatever that was that you did back there. We want clean hearts when we take communion. So I'm going to pray, and then we're just going to remain silent for a minute, and you can pray silently, thanking God for sending Jesus. And if you have unconfessed sin, now is the time to come clean. Ask God to forgive you, and he will. And then, when you're done praying, you can eat the bread and drink the cup. Let me pray first, and then we'll pray silently. Dear Heavenly Father, Just as brothers and sisters in Christ, together we want to thank you for sending Jesus. How he left his home in heaven and came to earth for one reason and one reason only, because he loved us, knowing ahead of time that he would have to endure the pain and the suffering on the cross, that his blood would pay the full price for our sin. And yet, God, we believe that even though he knew that pain and that death was ahead of him, he willingly and lovingly came because of his love for us. And God, as I've prayed, we've prayed many times, we want to thank you for allowing us to live on this side of the cross. It's so much, I think, in my mind, it's so much easier to live on this side of the cross than it would have been to live before the cross, waiting for the Messiah to come. But God, we thank you that Jesus' blood paid the price. We thank you that he willingly and lovingly went to the cross, his body bruised and broken. And we ask, Lord, that even as we
spend a moment in silent prayer that it would be meaningful to all of us who are praying. In Jesus' name, amen. And when you're done praying, you can eat the bread and then drink the juice. you have a great great week we're going to end with a word of prayer dean's going to come and pray for us i hope you have a great week remember to keep praying for the search team remember to give thanks to the lord for he is good and his love endures forever and lord willing we'll be back on june 13th yeah. we want to uh, now have a prayer for uh, prayer of dedication for steve as he heads out to zambia for for five weeks and uh, after I pray, then um, I'm going to call audible here, but uh, we'll just sing the chorus of the first uh, hymn that we did this morning. Uh, the words are, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name, and it's repeated one more time. So uh, after I pray, uh, we'll sing that, and we, you'll be dismissed. So if you would join me in standing, if you're able, uh, we want to pray for Steve, and being on the missions committee, we, we pray for him, and uh, we, try, we try to keep track of him. Good luck. Where he's heading next, I'm really happy for him that, uh, that he can head out to Africa. So, let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we want to lift up Steve to you um, as he teaches and trains uh, two different groups of pastors in Zambia. And I pray that your spirit would go before him to prepare the way. Give him just the right words to say, and may he be a big encourager to all that attend. Uh, keep him well, keep him safe, um, and give him good connections on his flights as well. We also commit um, uh, Sharon to you during this time of Steve being away, and may this time be free of anxiety and that you would give her your peace. We ask this all in your name, amen. Amen, thank you, Dean. So, They'll be out where the offering is dropped. And if you want to take one of those for this week, uh, please feel free to do so. Thank you.